It was my first term at university. I was burning the candle at both ends. I was really tired. I joined the Psychic Research Society, just as you do, something interesting. We'd had a Ouija board session, which is a bit of a daft thing to do and puts you in a bit of a funny state anyway. I went back to a friend's room afterwards, smoked a joint. This was 1970. Um, and well, we did that, that wasn't unusual. Um, and listening to some music, which I, I think was probably Pink Floyd, but I'm not sure. So there I am listening to wonderful music, sitting on the floor, really tired, a little bit stoned, not very much, going down a tunnel. And I was going down a dark tunnel towards a bright light. The tunnel was made of trees, but it, you know, I'd never heard of tunnel experiences. The term near-death experience hadn't been invented. But there I was, in retrospect I can see, going through the classic thing, down the tunnel, out of the end, suddenly I'm on the ceiling looking down, there's my body down there, there's my two friends over there. I'm on the ceiling looking down. And I could see the mouth down there going, I'm on the ceiling looking down. You know, oh, this is the real me, that's just a shell. So all those intuitions we have about being a spirit or a soul or something inside the body that can leave us, wow, it's really true. And then one of my friends said, well, can you, can you go move, you know? And I went shooting off and I traveled. I mean, it's a long story <laughs> to cut it very short. I seemed to travel the world, to fly over the sea and to become really, I was originally a sort of human shape, but then I became other shapes. And then I thought I got a bit frightened and I thought I had to come back and I couldn't get back. I got back to the room, but I was so disoriented. I tried to go inside the body and I went smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. I'd never heard of any of these things. They, they happen to yeah. people quite, not commonly exactly, but you know, all over the times and places they've happened. So I tried to get bigger, so I got bigger and bigger and bigger. And that led me to the classic experience, mystical experience of oneness, where uh, everything was, was me and not me. The, the concept of me made no sense. Time and space sort of, there were time and space, but not in the ordinary sense we know at all. I mean, things happened, but not within a ma matrix like, um, like we normally think of it. And then I was left at the end with a very powerful sense of wherever you go, there's always something further. And I came back saying that. It took me a couple of days to get remotely back to normal. Right. Um, and I had a very supportive friend who helped me. You can imagine, I was studying, you know, cutting up rats' brains to try and understand memory. That's the sort of thing we did in those days, long before the cognitive revolution and long before people were talking about meditation and mindfulness or anything like that. Um, and there I was, what's going on? Yeah. So looking back, I can understand why I leapt at paranormal explanations, even though they're hopeless and don't get you anywhere, because how could I possibly understand it? Now the science is catching up, but it's taken all those 44 years to, to make sense of, of what happened remotely. Obviously moving from that amazing out-of-body experience to uh, studying paranormal psychology and, and ultimately becoming a skeptic didn't happen overnight. No. Um, can you give us a sense for uh, how that path happened from moving to that experience to, to where you are I suppose now. Yeah, I, I, I struggled along. That was the first year of my first term of my three year degree. So I and I loved studying the physiology and psychology, but I kind of struggled along all the time with this in, in my mind. I ran the Psychical Research Society at Oxford for, for the whole time I was there. We did experiments with not just with Ouija boards, but telepathy and clairvoyance. And we went and visited haunted houses and we invited mediums to come and communicate with the dead with us. And, you know, I, I did a lot of that as an undergraduate. And then I was absolutely determined that I was going to become a parapsychologist because by then I discovered there was this thing called parapsychology that there were a very few scientists out there in the world studying these things scientifically and that's what I wanted to do and my tutor said you know no way that's rubbish you mustn't do that I got a sensible PhD place studying rat brains which I turned down and eventually I found a university that would let I had to pay my way got a job uh, did a part-time PhD which was really unusual in those days and funded my way and worked my way through a PhD and designed all these experiments. I'd got this grand theory of the Akashic records and the psychic field and the, the, you know, the phenomena out there that really memory is not in our brain at all, it's all out there. And that that's therefore when I get something telepathically from you, it's really the same thing as, as memory. Lovely theory. Sure. I discovered two things. One, I wasn't a, original in this. There are versions of that have been Bergson back in nine, 1910, you know, going way back, lots of them. And secondly, 
doesn't work. I did experiment after experiment after experiment. The first two or three experiments got little hints of what looked like ESP. Um, but as soon as I tightened up the methods, got the statistics right, did the experiments well, all the effects went away, and I did dozens of experiments that showed no sign of any telepathy or clairvoyance or precognition or anything. And so I, I thought, well, but I still know tarot cards work. By then, I learned to read the tarot cards. I had my crystal ball, um, and I learned, you know, I could stare into the crystal ball and see things and all this stuff. So I believed in those, and I had this extraordinary experience. So, of course, all my tutors are wrong. They're closed minded scientists. They don't realize there's more in the world in, than in your philosophy, all that stuff, you know. And I stayed like that for quite a long time. It, it was like it, the world, the truth, the evidence was eating away at my beliefs. And I had to drop that and drop that, and then there's another corner and another corner to turn and drop that. And then there came a point, and I can remember it, it's one of those sort of flashbulb memories, although I could have invented it, because we know the doubts about how memory works, but there's some truth in it at any rate, that I, I was sat in a bath one day in my house in Guildford, and I thought, what if none of it's true? And it was awful to then have to go through all I knew over the next sort of weeks, really, and think, is it possible that I was completely wrong? That experience happened. My memories of that are very clear. They could be a bit distorted, and I've selected bits and so on, but I cannot deny the experience, and I've met loads of other people who had extraordinary experiences too. Somehow, those experiences have to be valid, meaningful, life-changing experiences without there being telepathy, clairvoyance, other worlds, all of that stuff, which after experiment after experiment, uh, I'd found uh, just isn't there. And in a way, the rest of my life has been that unfolding. You know, I've had uh, jobs um, as a university lecturer and reader, and now a visiting professor at Plymouth, but most of the time I haven't had a job because, you know, <laughs> I would just want to, I want to do my research, I want to write my books, I want to, so I've sort of limped along kind of and made a life out of, out of exploring these things. Sure. Can you give us a sense for uh, what one of these experiments might look like? Um, so someone who might not be familiar with the experimental method and so on, if, if, you, wanted to, if you wanted to test, for example, uh, tarot cards or whether, where, whether one of these claims were true, um, what would it look like? I mean, how would you do the experiment? I, I t I'll tell you about uh, three very different approaches. Where I started was very lab-based, straightforward tests of telepathy and clairvoyance. So a simple example, I would get, I used to teach a parapsychology course to a lot of students at Surrey University. So I'd have maybe a hundred of them in a lecture theatre. And we would have hidden targets in another room and they would sit there with a sheet and they'd have to, you know, on a time signal, they'd have to think what the hidden target was and tick it off and then you do all the statistics and you compare it with how many correct you'd expect by chance. And it always came out just what you'd expect by chance. Um, those sort of experiments, you can say, well, that's not, te that's not telepathy in the real world. In the real world, it happens between twins. It happens when people are in special states of imagery or relaxation. So I moved on from those to get people into special states, to put them into Gansfeld with great relaxation and, and um, uh, white, white noise and uh, things over their eyes, to get them to imagine things. No, no better results. Um, a completely different kind of experiment, you mentioned the tarot. Now, I'd become a competent, not brilliant, but a competent tarot reader. And people said things like, how did you know that? That's, a me you know, all that stuff. So I devised a method for um, doing the tarot reading in two separate parts so that um, an assistant would sit down with the person, do all the laying out of the cards, get them in the right frame of mind and so on, get them to shuffle the cards, lay them out and so on, and then send them away, give me the order of the cards. I would get myself into the right frame of mind, imagine that the person was there, which they weren't, and do the reading to myself and then write it all down. I'd do that for 10 people and see, can those people pick their own reading out of the 10? No, they can't. <laughs> I'm trying all the time not to make it so artificial to try to make it more realistic. And finally, um, you mentioned out-of-the-body experiences. I, uh, for a very, very long time in my house in Somerset, I used to have targets in my house. I, I met this uh, strange young man who ran a 
astral projection group and a magazine and, and so on. And he said, he came to visit me and we talked about all this stuff. And he said, if you put a, a, a five digit number in your house, I will come and visit. And he said, um, I have out of the body experiences spontaneously at night. Um, I can't say when they're going to happen. But if you have that there all the time, when I have one, I will come and visit. And he said, cook me an apple crumble every so often. And I, that'll, that'll bring me there as my favorite thing. So I would do that too, you know. So this is not an artificial lab experiment. This is an ongoing experiment. Now, I had to put it where nobody could come and I didn't think he would. But, you know, I had to make sure he couldn't look through the window. I had to change the number every so often. And for the first few months, every Sunday evening, I changed the number. I had a word chosen from one in 20 words. I had a small object like a toothbrush or a penny or something. And I stuck that on the wall. So there were three possible things. And every time I met someone else who had spontaneous out of the body experiences, I would explain that to them and say, anytime you come. In all those years when that target, those targets were there, I had three people who wrote to me and said, um, I, I've been to your house and I've seen it, and none of them got it right. Oh, really? And one got one word right, yeah. but you know that in the, in the, that disappears in the in the, in the noise. Yeah. And they were sure they'd seen it. You see, when you have an out of body experience, it looks so vivid that you can't help but believe that you're actually seeing something physically there, but you're not. That's one of my favorite stories uh, of Susan's. I've been reading about this almost my entire academic career. The fact, what makes it unique, what makes her so outstanding is that she's the one who experienced this, right? She was the one who studied parapsychology right through the 70s all the way until now in, in looking at these very claims. She's the one that had this experience and changed her opinion about these experiences. So. And imagine, I mean, being in that sort of scenario, having this extremely vivid um, out-of-body experience, something that you couldn't possibly explain using anything that you have available to you. And she did experiment after experiment after experiment, 20 some experiments as part of this, as part of her degree to investigate these things. And all of them just kept coming up empty and she's, Amazing. I mean, imagine what it would take to fundamentally change your worldview about something as profound, something as vivid as that experience. It's, it's pretty, pretty phenomenal. Yeah, and I think Susan's in a unique position because, sure, there are many scientists out there who could have come up with a reasonable experiment to test these claims, but she was intimately familiar with this area. I mean, she, she lived it and breathed it. She talks about the tarot cards. And so she was able to set up an experiment that had scientific rigor and came up with things that, that you and I would never have imagined. The, the combination that the person had to guess and baking the apple crumble uh, really really puts her in a unique position to test these claims. And there are several others like this. There are actually former uh, magicians or, or magicians that spend a lot of their time revealing some of the, the tricks, the secrets behind things like magic and parapsychology. Uh, there's one James Randi or his stage name is the Amazing Randi. Darren Brown is another and Penn and Teller. Now, these guys, uh, are again in a unique position to test these claims because they live and breathe this stuff.